the Lieber Prize, which was um, funded by originally by Stephen and Connie Lieber, two of the legendary figures in our um, in, in this organization, and grew it to where it is today. Um, the Lieber Prize is for schizophrenia and contributions to schizophrenia. Uh, this year's awardee, I'm really pleased to say, is Robert Schwartz, who, there he is. He is a native of Vienna, Austria. Uh, we were chatting before the presentation and he pointed out, pointed out that it has an illustrious history, Vienna, uh, with people like, who did you, Sigmund Freud, that was, he's well known, uh, um, Eric Kandel here in the United States, but perhaps most importantly, the, uh, was it the grandparents of Alan Schatzberg, who's also on our board, came from there as well as Dr. Schwartz. He emigrated after getting, receiving his PhD there at the University of Vienna to the United States and joined the really important team at the Maryland Psychiatric Research uh, Program at the University of Maryland. He got there in 1979 and within, I think, six or seven years was a full professor, which is a really remarkable achievement. Um, so th that's how productive um, and, and good his work is. He's done most of his work on uh, glutamate um, metabolism and its role in serious mental illness and it is for that those contributions that his uh, presentation is is um, will be on and it's entitled from obscurity to hot topic the the chironetic 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 did i get it right this time ask the story so <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Schwartz, welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Don't worry about that, kind of. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Bob, for the very kind introduction. And don't worry about the misspelling uh, of the word. Uh, you're in very good company. I'm going to mention word, uh, names. So, um, Sorry for this old picture. It was not selected by me. The other one is more accurate. I want to start, uh, obviously, to, to th thank the, the prize selection committee, uh, Biff Bunny and uh, his six colleagues who, who selected me for, for, this, for this wonderful award. Uh, cannot thank you enough. <coughs> it's, 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 it's so special. Yeah, yeah. You know how I feel. Um, I, I just when, when you go to the list of people on the on the prize committee, seven people, all of them are MDs. Uh, just to, to make it clear, this is not a mistake. I'm I'm not an MD, just a PhD. So and I think it tells us something about the the BBRF and the the overall concept that MDs and PhDs have to work together, and uh, PhDs can make a contribution. Uh, but without the MDs, whatever they say is, is, is and, and detect is really uh, useless. So that's why I love to be part of the BBRC and its council. So, so thank you one more time uh, for, uh, for this wonderful award. So uh, also, I was, when, when I first found out that I have, to, uh, I have 15 minutes to talk, uh, then I thought, okay, I've worked on this for 40 years, so, so this, this is really hard. So then I decided, you know, why, why stick with 40 years? Let's go back 169 years. That's where the story really started. And it started with this paper by Justus von Liebig uh, in, in 1853. Uh, he discovered, he was a very famous chemist in the, in the, eight, in the 19th century, and uh, uh, this is the only paper he ever wrote. It's the whole paper. It's in German. And uh, he uh, found uh, in dog urine, that's where the name comes from, a compound that he termed, because of that, kynurenic acid. That's all. It took years and years until uh, this was followed up. And uh, I just want to show you, the only pictures I show you today are, people, uh, are pictures of people who are not around anymore. So just to make, make that clear. Uh, so I don't want anybody to be insulted. So um, 
as, as you see, quinolinic acid, tryptophan, kynurnin. So, uh, and you see the, 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 the dates. So this has been around for a long time. These compounds have been known, uh, but uh, only in the 1950s uh, it became clear that they're all related somehow. And uh, so this was about, the, again, in the 1960s where we stood. We know tryptophan is an essential... I don't know why I can use this, right? Sorry. Um, it's an essential amino acid uh, for us. Gets metabolized, as you can see, to serotonin and to this other compound, kynurnin, which we're going to talk a bit more in a moment. And uh, as we all know, uh, in the 50s, 60s, and also 70s, uh, serotonin was always the, the, the major interest for people in, in, in our field. And uh, kynurnin was uh, uh, not, not uh, really uh, you know, considered, although 95% uh, of uh, tryptophan, which we ingest, gets metabolized via this, it's called kynurnin pathway, named after this pivotal compound. And in the beginning, it was very much, as you'll see in a moment, uh, focusing on this uh, amino acid, quinolinic acid. And I want to give uh, credit, uh, really belongs to him, to Slava Lapin, who is not with us anymore, who uh, published uh, in the late 60s, together with Grisha Ochsenkrug, who is at Tufts still today, a good friend, and some of you may know, uh, they worked together, worked on serotonin antidepressants, right? But then uh, Slava uh, came up with this, uh, uh, this concept that these kynurnins, particularly this compound quinolinic acid I just mentioned, uh, causes seizures when injected into experimental animals. And then another paper came, uh, a couple of papers came out, and I want to give credit to uh, Trevor Stone, uh, who was in Scotland at that time, is now in London, and he published two papers, in, just look, two, two pages here, four pages here, in, in 1981-82, and they really changed the story, and as you will see for the rest of the talk, uh, m my career also. He showed that quinolinic acid is an excitatory amino acid, uh, and then kynurinic acid, which we'll hear a lot about, of course, uh, is an antagonist of the actions of quinolinic acid. So as I just said before, those uh, compounds are related to each other metabolically, and they're both uh, tryptophan metabolites. Um, I don't know if Bob mentioned, I'm a biochemist by training, so I was really turned on by this, because there's many enzymes involved and so forth, which we knew nothing about. So one of the things uh, that uh, we spent time on early on, we showed that quinolinic acid is an excitotoxin. Uh, this is something that I worked with, with uh, based on my postdoc period with Joe Coyle at Hopkins in the 70s, and was very interested in that, in excitotoxicity, and found that quinolinic acid is an excitotoxin. And kynurinic acid, or kynurinate, is a neuroprotectant. So those are the two compounds we just learned about electrophysiologically. They also have effects which could be very interesting uh, in, in various situations where nerve cells die or are protected from dying. So we started to focus more on kynurinic acid and less on quinolinic acid, and that's what I'm going to focus on for the rest of my talk. Now, as all of you know, the 1990s, it really started in the 1980s, but not before that, really. A glutamate was understood as a neurotransmitter. It was not known as a neurotransmitter before that, believe it or not. <clears throat> and uh, it turns out that kynurinic acid uh, blocks all ionotropic glutamate receptors, that means quisqualate receptors, canate receptors, uh, and also, importantly, NMDA receptors. And at lower concentrations, this was found a bit later, uh, it also blocks the glycine, uh, the obligatory glycine coagonist site of the NMDA receptor at lower concentrations. So this is mainly for people who are into, of you who are into pharmacology and, and, and basic sciences that they will, uh, can, can relate to this. So it was interesting, but it was not known that kynurinic acid is present in the brain at that time. So we, 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 we showed that. Uh, but uh, then we had to get away and think again. Uh, it's not only glutamate receptors that are affected. It's also the alpha-7 nicotinic receptor. And this was found by uh, my colleague at the University of Maryland, Edson Albuquerque, who uh, some of you I'm, I'm, I'm sure know. 
again, unfortunately passed away recently. And, and he showed, uh, without going into details, that chondritic acid also inhibits, but non-competitively, and not voltage dependently, uh, the alpha-7 nicotinic receptor. Now, this became, of course, and now we're getting more into BBRF-related uh, uh, terrain. Uh, this was interesting because, uh, for, for people uh, in our field, because, as I'm sure all of you know, glutamate and nicotinic receptor interactions in particular, or sometimes people think separately, play an important role, in particular in the cognitive impairments that you see in people with schizophrenia. So the obvious question that uh, we asked ourselves, we as a, uh, as, a, as a group, there's many, many people involved, and I'll come back to that in the end, uh, could kinetic acid play a role in, in, in these cognitive impairments because it blocks both the NMDA receptor and the alpha-7 receptor. So uh, let's learn more about this, and people start to do that. And this is just a summary uh, of, of, of uh, papers that uh, show that kynuronic acid, when this is in experimental animals, when increased uh, in the brain, causes various cognitive dysfunctions. So that went along with the concept I just tried to introduce to you. So one of the things we did, again, as, as biochemists, I also did my uh, a second postdoc, and I want to give credit to uh, Shell Fuchs and Thomas Höckfeld at the Karolinska Institute, who introduced me to immunocytochemistry, uh, which is a, a, a wonderful way to explore the brain. And so we made antibodies against this enzyme, chiminurin aminotransferase, uh, which is the housekeeping uh, gene, um, uh, enzyme uh, for chiminurinic acid production. So this is made chiminurin to chiminurinic acid through this this enzyme. We're going to hear about uh, another enzyme from Sophie Erhardt uh, in a few minutes, uh, but let her talk about this. So this enzyme, it turns out, was not a neuronal enzyme, but a glial enzyme, an astrocytic enzyme. So we had to start to think about not maybe chinric acid is a neurotransmitter, but maybe a neuromodulator coming out of astrocytes, which are, of course, very, very closely engulfing uh, neurons and synapses in general, in, in particular. And uh, also it's important to remember that astrocytes have a close link to the vasculature. So a lot of thoughts, which I don't have time to, to get into, but happy maybe we can discuss it later. So one of the things we, we did, we, we knocked out KT2, and we found out that when you decrease kynuronic acid levels in the brain, you improve uh, memory, in this case contextual memory. So too much kynuronic acid, cognitive dis, uh, dysfunction, too little kynuronic acid, specifically reduced here, you increase or improve uh, the, the you know, in, in behavioral effects, cogn cognitive effects, but also electrophysiologically, uh, we showed in these mice that the, uh, the uh, KT2 knockout mice, uh, this is the hippocampal slices, and long-term potentiation. You know this is an electrophysiological marker for uh, cognition, if you wish. Uh, and it's, it's much, much more, again, less kinetic acid increases long-term potentiation. So it goes in the, all in the same direction. That's interesting. So let me finally get into schizophrenia, because that's why I got my award for. And I work at the MPRC, the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center, which focuses on schizophrenia, and uh, it was a, a wonderful way to, to continue. Uh, Carol Tamminger and I, uh, in the 1980s, started a brain collection uh, with people who had, who had passed uh, with schizophrenia and, and controls, and uh, we were able then to, to just see what happens with kynuronic kynuronic acid uh, in the in this case, oh, sorry. Uh, in this case, the prefrontal cortex, and you see the increases—not dramatic increases, but 50 to 100 percent increases. And of course, variability. But we did this over and over. This is just one of the, the, the studies we, we published. It was the, was the first one, and uh, at the same time, Sophie Erhard, uh, and That's one of the reasons I suggested her for the Maltz Award, because she did from then on things for 25 years or whatever, 20 some years things independently, you're going to hear about this very soon. And she found that in people with schizophrenia, the CSF levels of chinuric acid are increased. Again, not hugely, 
but very much in parallel to what I just told you about the brain. So uh, then we said, okay, as again, as biochemists, enzymes are important. Look at this enzyme more carefully, because this enzyme, kinurinin monooxygenase, or KMO, as you see, this enzyme, would divert the production of kinuric acid towards these compounds. So let's look a bit more carefully into uh, what happens with this enzyme in people with schizophrenia. So we went back to our brain collection, new samples now, and look what we found. <clears throat> Again, this is in the prefrontal cortex, Broadman areas 9 and 10. Kinuric acid levels are up. So we reproduced what I just showed you before, and other people then also confirmed. But in the same tissue, the enzyme activity of KMO is reduced. So what does this mean? This means that we have to think about this uh, situation. KMO is reduced, and therefore the tryptophan metabolism goes to more kinuric acids. Those two things could be related to each other. That's the main point. So one of the obvious things to do then is look at uh, a KMO knockout mouse. So now we take away KMO. We did this together um, again with, with, with Sophie. And uh, again, this is just one of the, uh, I'll just give you a, sort of a summary slide here. This is the title, right? Relevance to psychotic disorders. So uh, there's uh, abnormalities. Now there's more kinuric acid in these animals, right? Less KMO, <clears throat> more kinuric acid. It has been verified, of course. Uh, and they have cognitive problems also. So it all fits together conceptually. That's the main point. So the obvious idea then is, and that's to the last part of my, my talk and tell a bit where we are now, based on these, this data, simple idea, right? So if too much kinetic acid is a problem, then let's, let's try to reduce its, its synthesis. And so we focus on astrocytes, where the KT2 is, as I showed you, by immunocytic chemistry, and let's try to block it. So how do you do that? You have to go back to pharmacology, and uh, the first compound we, we uh, minced together with my colleague Roberto Pellicciari uh, in, uh, in Italy. Uh, he uh, made this compound. He's a top-notch medicinal chemist. And then we used this compound in animals. And I don't want to go too much into details, but it can be used now as a tool, of course, in animals and see what happens, not with a knockout mouse, but what happens acutely when you reduce kynurinic acid levels. You can do with this compound. And what you can see, uh, and this is a bit complicated, sorry, kynurinic acid levels go down, and at the same time, glutamate levels go up. So kynurinic acid is a regulator of glutamate in the brain, and also of other neurotransmitters, by the way. And what was also very interesting, so this is when you give kynurinin, you increase kinuric acid levels, you reduce, uh, I'm sorry, this is my fault. Uh, you, you give kinurin the precursor, apologize for that. Uh, you increase kinuric acid levels and you reduce uh, glutamate levels. This is what I said before. When you reduce kinuric acid levels, glutamate goes up. So it's a bidirectional control that these astrocytes have over glutamate in the brain. This was shown in other brain areas as well. And also, uh, again, one of many examples, this, when you treat es uh, animals with ESPA, it, again, less kinuric acid improves performance, uh, for example, in the uh, water maze. So um, this is sort of the, the, the summary of what we, what we have so far. I call it chapter one, although it started 169 years ago, and then over the last 40 years was sort of uh, expanded, as I tried to explain, it's still chapter one. We're in the beginning of, of learning about this. Um, but we think it's worth continuing. i just briefly go over this. Fluctuations in brain kinuric acid in, uh, in vivo bidirectionally regulate glutamate. Even relatively minor elevations in brain kinuric acid, as you see in people with schizophrenia, uh, impair cognitive functions. Uh, the enzyme KT2 is, is, is very, very interesting in this context. Downregulation of uh, brain kinuric acid improves cognitive function in animals. And uh, where we stand now is we are trying to translate that uh, into the, the situation that is, of course, of, of eminent 
uh, as was said before, also a uh, central focus of, of the BBRF, and see what happens in humans. So what we are doing now, and again, when I say we, is this is many people who are part of this. This is work that was done by Laura Rowland when she was at the NPRC. So we give tryptophan to, to people. This has been done for 50, 60 years. It's safe. But what was not clear is what happens with cognition when you give. People have tried to do that. We can talk about this later. Uh, but these preliminary data in healthy people show you that uh, visual and verbal learning is acutely affected uh, in a negative way by, by tryptophan. And uh, what we're doing now, we're giving tryptophan to healthy volunteers, and we can monitor the effect of tryptophan in the blood uh, very, very nicely. So kinetic acid levels go up. That doesn't mean it goes up in the brain. That's a longer conversation to have. So that's what we're doing. And the final slide I'm going to show you here uh, that, that is very exciting to, to, to us and I hopefully to the field is that we went back to this KMO story and we looked at the, we and I say we again, Flav Giorgini, many other people involved in this, uh, not, not me, uh, but in collaboration. We looked at the KMO genotypes and it turns out that there are uh, a couple of SNPs that have been identified. So, um, and we didn't really know what, what, what that meant. But I went back to my friend Carol Taminer, who, is, who probably most of you know, is the chair of psychiatry at UT Southwestern now, and uh, asked her to go back to the B-SNP consortium, which again, for time reasons, I'm not going to detail. I'm sure you know about this. Uh, it's thousands of people in five different centers in the United States, clinical centers. Uh, that are involved in this. And I just asked her, oh, and they, they, they measure in those patients, those are live patients, of course, they measure uh, various outcome measures, including cognition. And uh, again, details uh, don't have time to go into this. And they ended up with a, a discrimination score. So the higher the score is, the worse the cognition is. And it turns out that one of the SNPs in this KMO gene, you know, uh, th those people, and this is 50% of the population, by the way, so 50% of us maybe, you know, have, have uh, cognitive problems. And so we're going to use this BSNP uh, consortium and the uh, availability or access to these patients and controls for the first study with a KT2 inhibitor that can be now very soon uh, be entering phase, uh, phase one. So again, I should stop here for time reasons, uh, probably was too late long anyway, but I don't want to, I thought really hard about this slide, by the way, and I decided not to add all the people that, that uh, I could because I'm sure I would have forgotten some people who got upset with me. So, uh, but very importantly, my mentors, including uh, Joe Coyle, uh, Will Carpenter at the Marison Psychiatric Research Center and Carol Tamminger and many, many others, uh, many collaborators throughout the world, uh, my mentees, needless to say, students, postdocs, and researchers. But without those, it's, it's always a team effort. We all, we all know that. And finally, I do want to appreciate not only, again, the NARSAT uh, that gave me a an award like a uh, distinguished investigator, I think it was, uh, 15 years ago, which is very, very important because, as was said last night also in, the, in some of the talks, uh, you know, if you start, do something new, the NIMH sometimes says, you know, give us some more preliminary data. And that's what the BBRF is, is uh, essential for, you know. So thank you very much uh, again to, to everybody uh, at BBRF. Uh, for, for being supportive. And then also the NMH, I want to really point out, they've been incredibly uh, supportive and, and wonderful to interact with. And I want to just uh, mention Steve Saltzman, who is the program officer of our county grants, and uh, it's been phenomenal and wonderful to interact with. So uh, sorry to be a bit over, maybe double the time or something, but uh, it, it's a long story. It is a long story. <laughs> and it's an ongoing story. So thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Very illuminating talk. Um, we have time really just for maybe one or two questions, and I'm going to ask you one that's real also related to our chat. Um, it's clear 
from your presentation that chiuretic acid uh, is really important in uh, regulation of glutamate, which is also important. I mean, which is important in schizophrenia, as you point out, but also for bipolar disorders. And I wonder if you can speculate. I asked him actually why he didn't look at bipolar patients, and he said, "Well, he doesn't have access to them because it's a schizophrenia center." So, but I'm wondering if you can speculate on its role in right. bipolar. So there's a lot of papers coming out now because it's becoming mm -hmm. a popular subject and people working on depression and bipolar. Uh, what is, n unfortunately, as we all know, with clinical studies, you, you see paper after paper, then you see reviews, and they don't go together. So there is reports that chinuric acid is up or down in people mm -hmm. with bipolar in this serum. So, of course, when you see those things, yes. I don't have to finish my sentence, right? You, you don't really know where to go. And should you spend two years in animal studies with, with, with see how it interacts with ketamine or so, or so? You know, this hasn't been done because it would take a lot of time to do, and I don't think uh, I'm the person to do this, but I'm sure people out there are looking into this. Great. Any, any other questions for Dr. Schwartz? It's a technical presentation, but I think very illuminated and very interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, and we need. To, can, we can we get stop. the lights on yeah. in the back? Thank you, so we can see people. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Mm. It, it doesn't seem like it's amplified, but I think if you just talk loud, we'll hear you. Okay. Uh, uh, before babies are born, you know, who are predisposed to schizophrenia and bipolar, can you help do intervention in the mother's womb before babies are born? Did you get me? Uh, oh, can you? If I understand you right, I'm, I'm not sure. I didn't hear it. But, Prenatally, what's yeah, going yeah, on? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, we are very much interested in this, and uh, the short answer is not yet. Uh, but as I said, you know, there may be a genetic uh, direction we can go, and of course, if that gets gets verified and, and confirmed, then of course we have a genetic approach to do this. The one thing, and then I'll I'll stop. One sentence I did not mention today: uh, when you prenatally treat. Uh, this is done in, in rats and mice, with kynurinin, so tryptophan, basically, uh, then you get in adulthood, in the offspring of these animals, cognitive uh, defects and dysfunctions. So there is a link there which we wrote a lot about. So we're very much interested in what's going on prenatally in the, in the fetal brain. Great. Thank you. I think then, because of time, we'll have to move on. Thank you very thank, much, Dr. Thank George. you so much.